Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Napoli and I serve as the president and CEO of the San Diego Police Foundation. And I'm your host today at America's Finest Canine Unit. As a matter of fact, you can probably see right behind me a training course and you'll actually see these athletic, beautiful dogs going through this course a little later in our session today. But first of all, I want to tell you that it takes the support of our community and in particular the generosity of individuals and organizations in order to have this program available to you. So let's give a shout out to our anchor sponsors, Adriana and Cristiano Amon. I also want to thank our Catalyst sponsor, Qualcomm. And I also am very grateful for the support of Securitas USA San Diego. Barbie and Dan Spinozola, and I have a special treat because two of our sponsors are right here with us today from VCA Animal Hospitals. And that is Michelle Gonzalez and Villain Vlasov, and they're going to tell you what they love about the canine unit. I know he's a canine, but I still want to just like, give him a hug. <laughs> I was a hospital manager for seven years and saw the, the amount of work that went into the training and care of the animals. And it just makes us proud to continuously make sure that they have the best possible care, that there are funds available to make sure that there are canines to protect the city. Absolutely, the care of the uh, canine unit is very important to us. We're very proud um, that we have the privilege to care for them from toenail trims to complex surgeries, um, and also including making sure that they are parasite free. And we're extremely proud that we have the privilege to take care of them and keep them in good health. Seeing what the dogs go through, seeing the love and care that the officers provide to their dogs, it's their partner, just wants us to continue to help in any way we can. It's extremely near and dear to my heart also, because uh, my husband also is an officer. So. It's uh, something that was really uh, prideful for me to be involved with and any chance I got to uh, you know, join a fundraiser or campaign or uh, do anything for outreach for the community, you can absolutely depend on us for that. Now we also, a little later in the program, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So be sure you watch your chat box and type them in because we'll be answering as many questions as we can live right at the end of our program. And now we're going to have an opportunity to meet the stars of the show, our beloved police dogs. And we are going to see what they do day by day to prepare for their role with their handlers to keep San Diego safer. The canine unit started roughly about 35 years ago. It started in 1984 and it was established with 12 originally founding canine officers and handlers who came to our unit in response to a lot of officer-involved shootings, a lot of officer fatalities that were occurring in the early 80s, late 70s. So a use of force panel was established and determined that the canine would be one component uh, to be utilized as an officer safety tool out in the field to prevent officers from running down dark alleys or going into deep buildings where suspects were waiting for them. I grew up uh, around working dogs. My, my dad was the director of the Border Patrol's canine. He ran that for over a decade. And um, I grew up with uh, police dogs. I came to San Diego specifically because at the time it had the largest canine unit in the country, metropolitan wise. I mean, in comparison to some of the larger cities, we're almost double some of the larger cities. Canine is one of those units that you're drawn to, you're drawn to because of the dogs, you're drawn to because of the type of work that they do. We provide services to all of our uniform personnel out in the city. It's a centralized uniform position and they respond to all of our emergency or what we call hot calls around the city. They respond to any of our violent suspects with weapons, um, burglaries in progress, or any hot or emergency call that has the propensity for violence, they're utilized. And they're utilized as a less lethal force component to basically go over there and be the first component of de-escalation involved in this particular incident. As we know, over the last decade, de-escalation has been one of the primary focuses in law enforcement around the country. Instead of officers immediately going to a higher force option, we now utilize the canine to try to bring things down, slow things down, and really respond as part of a crisis response team, as opposed to just going in there and grabbing somebody. So they will intervene on behalf of the officers 
oftentimes the suspect will see the canine and they'll, they want nothing to do with that dog. And ultimately, that's the best case scenario for us is to show up just utilizing the psychological deterrent or the actual presence of a dog and get that compliance. And that's the perfect scenario. Our bite ratio is actually less than 0.01% of all of our contacts in the field, less than 25 times a year. So our bite ratio is extremely low in comparison to the number of times that dogs are not only deployed, but the number of calls that radio, of radio calls that officers actually go on. So behind us, you see the, it's, it's our canine memorial. And on here are some of our past canine handlers and our past canine uh, patrol dogs. It's an awesome part of our, our unit. It was, it was provided by our, the police foundation. And it, it's something nice that we can come out to. And it's, it's, a, it's a big showpiece when we have people come over. It's, 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 it's an awesome thing. We had several officers and we've had several canines who have been injured on duty, but in, in the 35 plus years that we've had, we've only had the one canine that's been killed in the line of duty. That's one too many if you ask us, obviously, but, but we've been very fortunate in the fact that these dogs are very resilient. They're tough dogs and it's just part of the job for them. They're, they're incredible animals. You may remember Officer Jonathan Weiss from one of our previous videos in which we featured his relationship with Ufo, his now retired police dog. Officer Weiss is on the training field today to guide us through some essential activities that the dogs and their officers perform daily here at the canine facility. Okay, right now we have Officer Langley and his Belgian Malinois Ace. They're out here on our training field. Uh, they're gonna be doing some basic obedience. Uh, obedience is the uh, the standard for all our training. We start all these dogs and all these handlers uh, with obedience. What that's doing is it's building the bond between the dog and the handler. Uh, the dogs are very much pack animals and they're always looking for directions. In this case, the handler is the pack leader for this dog. So what the dog is out here doing is not only is he learning from the handler and following the handler's instructions, he's having fun doing so. If you'll watch right now, the dog's gonna down and what Langley's gonna now do, he's gonna do some basic obedience with the dog. The dog is doing it because he wants to please the handler. He wants to please his pack leader because he knows he gets rewarded for doing the right thing. In this case, the reward for this dog is playtime. Uh, all these handlers will do 15 minutes of obedience every day they work for an hour a week. Not only does it help build that bond between the handler and the dog, it also gives the dog a chance to get some exercise. It gives the handler a chance to check on the health of the dog, to check to make sure the dog's not limping, having breathing issues. As you can see, the dog is very attentive to the handler. Again, these dogs are working class dogs. They work, they want a job to do. His job right now is to please his handler, to make his handler happy. If you'll see now, Jason will take the dog up to the jumps because in the field, these dogs aren't gonna do all their jobs out here on a nice grass field. They're gonna do some of the stuff in attics, in parking lots, uh, at, at parks. So some of the stuff we have to do is going through things like tunnels, cramped spaces, up and over a wall, uh, different fences. If you don't know, dogs don't have the same three-dimensional vision that humans have. So when they come up against a chain link fence or they come up against a slatted fence, sometimes their depth perception is not there. So we're teaching this dog that when the handler tells you to do something, trust your handler. He's not gonna lead you astray. Same thing jumping through windows and confined spaces. This is gonna transition later. Now when the handler needs the dog to jump through a car window, the dog's used to doing it. When the handler needs him to jump over obstacles in the field, they're gonna do it. Um, and again, this dog is doing it because it wants to do it. There's two concepts of training. There is, uh, and you see right now he's getting rewarded with a uh, Kong. So what he's doing, he's, he's, he's in what's called prey drive now. He's going out, he's catching that animal, that Kong, and he's bringing him back to his handler because that's what the handler wants. And he does it because the reward is now going to be, he gets the Kong, the Kong thrown again for him. Out in the field, when, when we ask these dogs to go up against people a lot larger than them, they're gonna trust their handler because of this scenario here, uh, the reward of the play. So if you notice, this uh, ace is a Belgian Mal. Well, right there was what Jason just did was what's called a call off. He sent him out to go get his toy, but the last second told him, no, hang on, come back. So that is one of the greatest tools that we have as, as canine handlers is the ability to recall our dog as little as recall him off a toy that he's really excited to get, or we've sent him on a suspect, that suspect's now surrendered, and we want to stop the use of force. So unlike the other uses of force, to include you know, a handgun, uh, beanbags, or even a taser, once those tools are, are put into use, 
you can no longer get those tools back. That is our number one thing is we have the ability to recall. The other option is too is these dogs we don't have to worry about aiming. Um, you know, once we once we send them to do, no matter what the suspect's actions are, the dogs will adapt to them. So now on the field with me is uh, Officer Cassie and her dog Valdo. Uh, if you notice, Valdo is another one of our Belgian Malinois. I'd say uh, the majority of our dogs are Belgian Malinois, and the reason for that is these dogs all come from mostly Europe or the sporting dog uh, countries. What we do is we purchase these dogs after they've done their uh, competition work. Uh, the San Diego Police Foundation has actually bought these dogs for us uh, for over the last almost 20 years. At price tags of uh, just over $14,000, uh, we wouldn't have a unit this size with this ability to, to do what we do without the San Diego Police Foundation. Uh, the reason the Belgian Mountain was kind of taken over uh, police work and sporting work is because of their athleticism, uh, their health, and then again, the willingness to do the job. Remember, we're asking these dogs to do things solo. They're asking them to go after uh, subjects that are two to three times their size. A pack animal like this wouldn't normally instinctually do that. They would actually go out in a pack. Right now, Cassie's out here doing what's called a two toy uh, process. What she's doing is she's throwing one toy for the dog. When he brings it back, he re she rewards him with the second toy. So a lot of dogs, what they'll do is, okay, why will I run out and get that first toy when I know you're holding the second toy? So it's a lot of, again, obedience that the dog has to listen to what the handler wants. Don't think for yourself, do what I'm asking you to do because I might know something you don't know. Same thing goes for our agilities. Cassie, if you want to take them up to the jumps, same thing goes with our agilities. You'll notice the Malinois are excited to do the jumps. They want to jump, they want to go through the tunnel. Versus you'll have a, a German Shepherd who's more of a thinking breed. Well, I'll go around the jump, I'll go around the tunnel because it's easier. So it, it tends to be a lot more of a uh, thinking man's game to teach these dogs to, to listen and do what they're told. I'm really enjoying being here at the canine unit today. And no matter how many times I come, I always learn something new. I imagine you're feeling the same way. Let's see what you're learning. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. On your screen, you'll see this question. How many canine teams are currently working with America's finest canine unit? Take your best guess. We'll have the answers for you at the end of the session, but meanwhile, I wanna ask you another question. In the year 2020, how many calls did this canine unit respond to? Take your best guess. The answers are on the screen, pick one. We'll have the answer for you at the end of the session. And now we're gonna go back and see our canine unit in action. And the thing that amazes me is the bond between the handler and the police dog. Let's go see. My name is Mitch Tani. I've been with the San Diego Police Department for eight years, uh, the K-9 unit for one, and uh, my dog's name is Hondo. My name is Ted Lorendo. I've been with the department 13 years, and specifically with K-9, two years, and my police service dog's name is Robbie. My name is Javier Morales. I've been with the San Diego Police Department um, 12 and a half years, and on the K-9 unit about three and a half years. Uh, my dog is Titan. My name is Jason Langley. I've been on the police department for seven years, and I've been on canine for a year. My dog's name is Ace. Always grew up with dogs uh, and I don't think I've ever had a point in life where I didn't have at least one dog. I have four now uh, including Hondo so definitely definitely an animal lover. You bond with your dogs at home. We spend just as much time with these dogs. Um, 40, 50 hours a week in a car. Um, honestly I probably see my work dog more than my personal dogs. We're with each other all day long. We eat together, eat in the car. He eats half my food. I don't eat half of his food, but uh, you know we hang out all day long. We play, we work, we train. Um, so it's a great bond. Hondo's the only one that uh, works for a living. The other rest of them are mooches. But uh, yeah, he's he's fun. A at home, they just like to rest. Uh, like like me on weekends, you know, just kind of veg out at home and uh, you know eat and relax. Uh, that's pretty much the same dynamic for him. Robbie's high maintenance, so <laughs> when it's the weekend, it's still work for me. I got to pull him out like every hour. He's a uh, he let me know. He doesn't really bark too much. He has a more of a whine. Um, yeah. Sounds a little bit like ah, like that, and I can hear it for reverberates throughout the house. And my wife will tell me, "Go get Robbie," and yeah, it never stops. So what you're seeing here is a simulated pursuit. Oftentimes, uh, K9 
canine will be one of the leads in any type of pursuit that we're involved in. And they're there obviously to mitigate risk and mitigate force that we utilize. So right now we have this car set up. We have a, we have a suspect inside the car with the bite suit. And we're gonna try to get compliance verbally, but also utilizing the canine as, as a psychological deterrent. So our main goal here is to try to get compliance from this, this individual. We don't want to use force. Um, we don't want to use the canine um, other than the psychological deterrent unless the actions of the suspect dictate that we do so. so the suspect is compliant right here. So this sort of training occurs um, right now. The post mandate is four hours a week. But we've nearly doubled it um, with our own our own type of reform, adding more training to really mitigate mitigate risk to officers and, and suspects. So the suspect's going to be taken into custody. However, we still have an issue with this car. We don't know who's in there. We don't know what sort of threat is in there. And then so we're going to utilize this canine to go into the vehicle to ensure that there's nobody else in there that's going to pose any problems or sa safety concerns for officers. So as you can see, it's really important for the dog to be able to come back. It's called a call off or a, basically he's calling them back. So that's, that's, that's pretty important to have that, that verbal compliance from our dogs to be able to be called off whenever we tell them to. So in January, end of January, uh, we were on a standoff with a male um, who had put himself on top of a Conex box. Um, after about, I think it was four hours or so, he jumped down um, and started walking towards us armed with uh, what we could see as a razor blade and then his hand holding something wrapped in a piece of cloth. Uh, he was impacted with a beanbag uh, and then took off running. So fearing for the officers on the perimeter and the public that was around because it was in the Rosecrans area, lots of traffic, lots of people walking around, I sent my dog, um, Titan. Uh, unfortunately, as he spun around to face us the second time, Titan was airborne um, and he stabbed him in the stomach. Uh, he had a lacerated colon, uh, so we were able to take him to custody first. Uh, as soon as he was in handcuffs, I picked up Titan, we ran to my car, and uh, someone drove me to the VCA hospital. Um, obviously, he was bleeding profusely. Uh, he had three lacerations in his colon, uh, so he immediately, we got lucky the surgeon happened to be there. Uh, so they took him into surgery immediately. I believe it was, I'd say five to six hour surgery, so we just stuck there waiting, waiting to hear. Um, no updates in between, um, hoping for the best, and uh, he pulled through. Uh, we spent a week together. I spent my whole week at the hospital with him. Uh, they set up a little room for us, which is really nice. Um, since it's COVID, those rooms are empty, so they, I brought a cot over. One of the guys from the office brought a cot for me, and we spent the whole week there. And uh, came home the way next week, and he's, he's doing remarkably well. And was out training with us just yesterday, and uh, I mean, the dog, he's doing great. I don't think he's having any issues. We would never tell he was in an incident, minus the funky haircut he's got, but <laughs> besides that, he's doing, he was definitely putting in work, so. And Officer Morales is very uh, humble about it, but um, himself and Titan are probably one of our best partnerships on this unit um, in regards to the strength of the pair, in regards to, the, to Titan's ability. Titan has been involved in a lot of apprehensions that have, I think saved us from use, having to use lethal force in a situation where it would be permitted. Um, so we saved, ended up saving the suspect's life with the use of Titan and then with the skills and abilities of Officer Morales as well. So um, he won't tell you that, but it's, it's definitely known throughout the unit. So this is our training house. We, this is kind of, it's, it kind of emulates and more of like a two bedroom and one bathroom apartment in like our mid city area or uh, Western division area. And so what it does has an upstairs, downstairs. We have an attic for training. We also have a crawl space for training. And we've also provided them with some environmental challenges such as stairs, slick surfaces, wood, high fines, low fines. So right now what you're seeing is you're seeing Hondo do what's called a, uh, a low fine. He's doing a crawl space search for his toy that's in there. So he's on odor in there. And this kind of just shows, this shows how, how our dogs are, are pretty versatile and going low, going high, and really just going into places that are very precarious areas for handlers to go into. So what we're gonna see here is you're gonna see Kena and Hondo go into this building. He's gonna do what's called a, a, just a quick cursory search using odor, using his nose, 
to try to determine some sort of anomalies in there. Right now, his ball is hidden in there as the odor that he's going to be indicating on. Thank you. So sometimes officers will be called upon to search an attic. Um, suspects might run up there, but if we want to clear a house, the canine can utilize to really mitigate officer risk. So this is our, our traditional standard attic deployment. You see Officer Tani has secured his PSP, his dog, to his shoulder. He's going to be going up and doing the attic deployment. Canine job is a very de physically demanding job. Um, you obviously take your work home with you, you figuratively and, and literally. Uh, but as you can see, these dogs are weighing this guy's he looks little, but he's about 75 pounds of muscle. So right now we have a suicidal subject right here with a knife. He's been, he's armed. Um, officers over here are basically, they're, they're coming in over here with a, what we call a crisis response team. They're going to be utilizing less lethal force options, such as a beanbag, as well as the canine as the primary contact um, officer. Chris, San Diego Police, but I need you to drop the knife or I'll send a police dog to be bit. No, nah, man, it's too much You to need to I'll... drop it now. No, nah, I'm over it, man. I can't, okay. I can't deal with Tell me what's anymore. going on, bud. So as you can see, we have an uh, individual doing lethal cover. We have an individual doing what's called less lethal with the beanbag. And these are contingencies that are put in place in the event that the suspect's actions change from time to time. So this, this scenario will probably last upwards of 45 seconds right here, but this could go on for a long, long time because what, what officers and what we're trying to do as a police department is really mitigate our involvement as far as utilizing force. We don't want to use force. Officers don't want to use force. So if we can use verbal judo and really mitigate force by communicating and by having this basic this psychological deterrent with the canine that's the option that we want to go so as you can see the the officer is negotiating with the suspect trying to get him to surrender he's basically threatening him saying that he's going to be uh he's going to send the dog in the event that the that the guy doesn't drop the knife or if he approaches officers chris come on. look like you're in the military can we get somebody to talk to you here we go all right perfect now do me a favor turn around face away from me get your hands up high all right man i give up dude i'm sorry as you can see through the knife he's given up and ultimately, this is what we want. This is the, the perfect scenario for us. He's given up, he's compliant. And as you can see, the dog's barking at him and that's kind of what we want. We want him to continue to think that there is a threat that the dog could potentially be used. The dog's only gonna be used in the event that he tries to, to fight or attack officers or run. And that's the end of the perfect scenario. I hope you've enjoyed our time here at K9. I know I have, and I bet you're waiting to hear the answers to those questions. So I have them for you. You'll be amazed to hear that there are 36 teams that work with America's finest K9 unit. If you pick that one, you're a winner. And then even more amazing, how many calls in 2020 did this unit respond to? That number is 21,541. That equates to two or three every single hour. So while we have been here together for a half an hour, our canine unit has responded to one or two calls, keeping San Diego safe. Safety and health are things that we tend to take for granted until they're threatened. This last year, all of us have felt that threat to our health and safety. And so I call upon you to, if you have it in your heart, support this Safety for All series. With your donations, we'll be able to share with the community what our police department actually does, how, and why. Here at the Canine Unit, you may be amazed to know that every single police dog that has worked with SDPD since 2003 has been purchased by community donations. So we welcome a gift of any size to support America's Finest Canine Unit and our Safety for All series. We're going to have a Q&A in a few moments live, so stay with us. But meanwhile, I wanna thank our sponsors once again for helping bring this program to you.